time with Herman and Sharon. I love you there. Okay, Hi we'll get everybody. there. We go. <laughs> okay, we got the aerial shots. We got the close shots. That's right. Okay, just don't. We like that. The, yeah, Moves I around. I know. That's that's Herman and Sharon. This is Sharon right here. Mm -hmm. With notice, it has two R's. Two R's. <laughs> that be, that began yeah. as a mistake, and it kind of stayed with her, because your mother. I'm a big mistake, Herman. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> no. No, he's not. Uh, we've been 60 he's years, a little crazy 60 today, years folks. married, and she is definitely not my mistake. Uh, her, uh, tell, tell what your mother did to your birth, birth certificate. Well, she never looked at it, for one thing, so we didn't know that there was a mistake on the birth certificate till I was probably 20. And so I had to go, she went and finally looked at the birth certificate and found out they had made a mistake and put two R's in Sharon. And so she just crossed out one of the R's. Well, yeah. Which and is I illegal. Said, <laughs> I said, you can't do that. So <laughs> do that I started just using the two R's and not instead of going through yeah. all the trying to yeah. change it, I just said, oh, well. So Which is that's unique. how I became sharing with the two R's. Which is unique. <laughs> You're very unique. <laughs> I guess I am. But there are a few other Sharon's yeah. with two R's. We, we've I both, think I met one. We've both had problems with our names because Herman, I, I just hated the name Herman. I literally hated it. Even to this day, when I go at a Starbucks and they want to give your name, you know, when you order coffee with your name, I'll, I'll say Bailey because I don't want the girl saying Herman. <laughs> so, so I, so I told my dad. He says, "Why do you always you don't like that name?" I said, "Dad, uh, my name is uh, Herman Eugene Bailey." He said, "Well, you were supposed to be called Eugene." I said, "Well, Dad, if I was supposed to be called Eugene, why didn't you put it first? He goes, I always liked the name Herman, so I was a junior. But so we both had, you know, issues with our names. I like my name though. You didn't. This <laughs> this name you're about to hear, yes, is one of my top ten guys. Three thousand <laughs> interviews. He's a top ten. Yes. And his name is William Federer. He he needs to have some kind of a badge okay. or something. Hey, hey, Dave, can you get a close up of the guy because they need to see his face. A close up. Are you ready, yes. William? <laughs> William J. Federer, we have, uh, and we had him uh, yesterday. Yesterday, thank you. And we're, he was so good, we had to have him back today. Well, you're good. Still talking because we didn't get through the book at all. But he's best-selling author, national speaker, president of America Amerisearch Inc., former U.S. Congre congressional. I can never say that for some reason. Congressional candidate. He has a radio uh, <laughs> a program, American Minute. Faith and History television program, all kinds of stuff, and we're going to talk to him today. <laughs> okay. You know, you go through all that, and people just want to hear what he's got to she say. She did all that yesterday, and then she, you know, <laughs> you just missed out. We well, ought to heard what she said yesterday. Unbelievable. We I have, know. We have to read. They it. want to hear him, not me. Good to have you back. Great to be with you, Herman and Sharon. And yes. and, and he's a family guy. How, uh, you have a beautiful wife. Yes. I mean, literally. Very beautiful. I mean, I'm not making that up. No, she's, and you, she's you have, gorgeous. You have. How many children? Four. And their names? Um, Jessica. Yeah, the Will, same. He forgot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's no. got so much going on in that yeah. brain of his. And they, um, we, we've done some where we call them by their middle names. Really? And really? Then, yeah. And, and then when they get a little bit older, they switch to the. So first what are name. the names? Uh, Jessica and Joy and William Gabriel, uh, Catherine Melody, and. Uh, Richard Michael. Wow. All right. So, the first one is is what name? Uh, Jessica. And the last one? Uh, Michael. <laughs> so he's Richard Michael, but he goes by Michael. Yeah. Wow. Well, Eugene, you want to tell us about what the <laughs> yeah, book is about today? <laughs> I, mean, I, am, I love this. And by the way, <laughs> the, the, the author of this book is Susie Federer. There it is on the screen. So, and I mean, it is. It's a keeper. You've heard me say that on other books or whatever. You know, uh, uh, Randy Alcorn is probably one of my favorite authors. I mean, just, so is William Federer. But, but just to give you a little idea of what caliber I go for, okay? <laughs> but have you have you ever read any of Randy Alcorn? Some, book? yes. Oh, yeah. get his book on heaven. Read his book on heaven. You yeah, it's her. Herman loves that book. You, you know, with your brain, <clears throat> you will absolutely drink it like water and remember it which then you could come back to me 
after I've read it twice and explain to me what the book said. All right. <laughs> so you co-authored this with your wife in this book here. Right, so I sent out a daily email called American Minute, uh -huh. something that happened on each date in American history, famous battles and scientists and Lewis and Clark and, uh, you know, William Penn. And, and so she w would go through them and pick out the best stories. And they're ones that uh, we did a first volume where they were the famous battles where there's mm -hmm. a crisis, they pray and have courage, and things turn around with, um, you know, uh, s storms coming right at the right time and rescuing the troops. But this one is the revivals in American history. And so this is really fascinating because it traces the, the story of the move of God and the ripple effects that come out of it. Wow. And today we've gone through a generation of trying to erase God. But when you get back in, to history, it had a very formative powerful effect on our country. Uh, <clears throat> with, with the ability that you have to, I mean, literally remember mm -hmm. everything that you write, which is, which is so amazing. Yeah, but if, you have, if you don't have any William Federer's books, uh, order them on Amazon or wherever you go. You know what, this, this actually just happened recently. <laughs> we were in a mall, and they, this mall has a used bookstores, which I always had for the I either head for bookstores or jewelry stores, but this has a huge book. And I'm looking at in the religious area, and William's William Federer's book there in America, you know the one that I love, all of the presidents and all the <laughs> prayers and everything. And I'm I'm looking at it and I'm going, you probably ought to leave that Herman there for you know somebody coming in here. And I go, I can't leave that there. <laughs> so, so I bought it. You bought it. I, bought it. <laughs> I come out. She goes, what it, you bought a book? I said, yeah, look at it. I said, I got three of them in my office. I just couldn't pass this up. Oh, and, thank you. And, but, but I mean, but, but I'm just, I mean, your books are that way. You just, it's, but you, you know what you've written. I mean, I have authors or whatever, and I got to remind them what they wrote in their book. Well, one of the interesting ones is the, the book to heaven story. And if you want, I could share that. Yeah. Yes, yes. So Lewis and Clark, 1804, go to the Northwest and meet lots of Indian tribes and evidently had told them about Christianity and that there's a Bible. Well, they come back and several years later, four Indian chiefs come from the Northwest looking for the book to heaven. And they get to ah. St. Louis, Missouri uh, right. They go to visit some Catholic churches, some Protestant churches. They visit with William Clark of the Lewis and Clark, and he was the governor of the, all the Louisiana Territory. But there just happens to be a big Methodist uh, convention in St. Louis, and they hear about this, and they write it up in their newspaper, which was one of the largest circulation newspapers in the country. And so then there is a doctor in the Northeast named Marcus Whitman. And he and his wife, Narcissa, they get the call to missions. And so they leave behind everything and wow. they come to St. Louis and they end up going all the way uh, through the ter traveling to get to the Northwest Territory. And they start a mission work amongst the Indians. And they bring others with them, the Spaldings and so forth. Well then the British had Canada and the, the British Columbia, the border between that and America was a little bit iffy. And so there were some in the, our U.S. Congress that said, we can't defend this. It's too big of a territory. Um, and some of them said, well, we don't want any new states coming in because it'll dilute our percentage of control in our government with new. And so you had people that were again, they, and they were ready to trade away the land of Washington and Oregon to the oh British. Oh my goodness. And so uh, Marcus <clears throat> Whitman travels 4,000 miles. He goes from Walla Walla, Washington, oh, all yeah. the way down to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and then follows the Santa Fe Trail all the way back to St. Louis. And then he gets all the way to Washington DC and he comes in and the president was Tyler at the time and he uh, comes in with his leather breeching and his sunburnt and everything and he says don't give away that land until I can bring uh, some settlers up there and so this begins the Oregon Trail wow. and he okay. begins to bring people up there to settle it uh, it's just a fascinating it, yeah. chapter in American yeah. history and the, the president mm -hmm. that dedicated the trail was uh, Warren G. Harding and he said never in history has there been a finer example of the uh, patriotic flag following the cross uh, of Christianity. 
So the missionaries went first, and then following it came the, the American government. That's a great story. William Catherine Booth, right? You have a chapter, William and Catherine Booth, the Salvation Army. So you had uh, this Second Great Awakening revival, and uh, great things happened. If I could throw in the one story quickly of John Stewart. You can Stewart. do anything. This is <laughs> your show. So uh, a black man, he's a dying. You know how you, your clothes, you have blue jeans? Well, mm -hmm. somebody has to dye them yeah. blue. And so he was a cloth dyer, and he's traveling through Ohio, and he gets robbed. All of his life savings are taken. And he goes to Marietta, Ohio, and uh, drinks. He wants to drink himself to death. And he's got a buddy they're drinking with. And he uh, is coming back one night, walking through the woods, and he hears some singing. It is one of those camp meetings. And he gets up closer and closer, and the, the Holy Spirit pulls on his heart, and he ends up getting saved. And he ends up coming back and back more and more. One time, his drinking buddy said, hey, let's have one more binge. And he said he had planned to do it, and that very day his drinking buddy got killed. And he's like, okay, I guess I'm not going to go back there. And the Lord somehow speaks to his heart to go west. And he just feels this impulse that he's just supposed to go. And so he leaves the camp meeting area, and he just starts traveling across creeks, across hills, across valleys, across, wades across rivers. And, and he's just going west. He's just following this command. And he runs into the Wyandotte Indian tribe. And it had never been reached by the gospel. And there was a uh, black man who was a runaway slave. And, and John Stewart is a black man. Uh, and so he interpreted for him. There was a chief named Between the Logs uh, who had gotten drunk. And the Indians had a higher metabolism because they lived out you know, in the woods. Yeah, and so yeah. when they drank alcohol, they, their body processed it immediately. And, and uh, so the, the Indian chief had gotten drunk and killed his wife. He like wakes up and finds a dead wife there. What happened? You killed her. And he's like, ah. Well, <laughs> he ends up uh, preaching, uh, and the chief gets Who saved. Who ends up preaching? Uh, John Stewart. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's sort of interesting. Uh, he gets there when they're having uh, an Indian dance, and they're you know making yeah. their dances and making their sounds, and he starts singing with his low, deep va bass voice, yeah. you know, like Amazing Grace or yeah. something, and the whole Indian camp gets quiet, and he sings the song, and when he gets done. This is all quiet. And one of the Indians says, more. So he sings some more. And, and so he sings for them. And, but they all get touched. And so the, and the entire tribe gets saved. And he starts a school, starts a church, starts teaching them all. Finally, oh, another yeah. uh, you know, Methodist missionary comes and sort of takes them under the wing. But um, is sort of the you know, administrative type person. But here's this tribe. Well, then the Democrats push through the Indian Removal Act. Right, the Republican Party was not invented yet, um, and so the the Democrat Party was started by Andrew Jackson, and they pushed through the Indian Removal Act, mm -hmm. and it was to chase yeah. all the Indians out. They double crossed yeah. them, and so some of them went right away, and then others stayed. Said no, they're they're not going to follow through with this, uh, and they eventually did with the federal government sending troops with bayonets to get the Indians out yeah. of their homes. It was called the Trail of Tears. Yeah. But before the Trail of Tears, you had some that voluntarily left. And one of those was the Wyandotte Indian tribe that had gotten Christian because of John Stewart. And they find some land uh, where the Missouri uh, River is out in western Missouri, where uh, Kansas. And so they, um, the whole tribe moves, this tribe of Christian Wyandotte Indians. And they settle, and they, they settle the city called Wyandotte City. And later it was renamed Kansas City. Is that and Kansas right? City is in Wyandotte County, right? And so wow. here, Kansas City was started by a Christian Indian tribe that was evangelized by a black man, John Stewart, who had a terrible tragedy in his life of getting robbed, but then he ended up coming to the Lord. Yes. Just a neat it really story is. of American it history really that is. has the And it's in the book, please. <laughs> you will love this book, I'm telling you. Uh, but so, you mentioned the booths. Yes. Yeah. So there's a, a lawyer named Charles Finney. And this um, uh, Charles Finney, Charles Finney, and he ends up um, hearing about uh, the Second Great Awakening revival, and he decides he wants to get a Bible. He never owned one, but he, he mm -hmm. back then you didn't go to law school; you apprenticed with a lawyer, and you would read Blackstone's Law Commentary. He was an English guy who wrote the law that was popular in America. Well, Blackstone's Law Commentary 
has all these references to the Bible and scripture verses. So Charles Finney buys a Bible, reads it, and he decides he wants to give his life to the Lord and goes out and he into the woods and he prays and he says, I'm not going to leave here until the, until the Lord touches me, you know? Yeah. And he says, the presence of the Lord came over him. He felt, felt waves of love, wow. right? He goes back into his office. He locks the door. He prays all night long. He forgot how the time was. And the next thing he knows, it's the morning time. And he comes out of his office and somebody comes into the law office. It was a church deacon who was suing another church deacon. And they said, how's my case coming along? And Charles Finney said, you're going to have to get another lawyer because I've been retained by a higher power. <laughs> <laughs> and he ends up preaching the gospel with a lawyer's skill and conviction, mm -hmm. like he's driving home a case. Yeah. And it's very convincing. And he um, begins to stop using the V's and vows and, and using the old English and, and ta praying in common language and so people could relate to him. And he said, look, uh, he had a meeting and he said, you serve the devil openly. I'm going to call for you to stand up and serve the Lord openly right now. And he's the one who invented altar calls. Anyway, so wow. his, his message of going to, being a Christian is more than just going to church. You have to make a commitment to the Lord. And there has to be some fruit to show you've made that. Yeah. That preaching influenced someone named um, George Williams. And he started the YMCA. He was over in England and he read this and he says, and he says, um, so the YMC is the Young Men's Christian Association. That's right. And uh, he said, there's no power that can change a young man's heart more than the gospel. And so the, the athletics was a means to get them to come in yes. so that they could be evangelized. Right now, some of these organizations uh, struggle with with their mission sometimes and say, well, you know, let's get a little bit of the gospel out so we can do more of the athletics. Yeah. No, no, the purpose of the athletics was to bring them in yes. so they could get evangelized. Someone else mm -hmm. that heard, uh, read Charles Finney's sermons, he called them lectures on revival, was William and Catherine Booth. And they are over in England and they read it and they decide that they're going to uh, answer a need that was going on, and it was sex trafficking of, of children. Going in, on today. In England, yeah. right. And so this what, is- Back then they had the it Early going 1800s, on too? right. So there, really? there was no age of consent, and they, <clears throat> these rich, terrible uh, sex traffickers would come to a poor family and say, oh, if you let us have your daughter, we'll provide an education for her mm -hmm. and we'll give her a good future. The parents are like, really? Promise, promise, promise? Yeah, yeah. Well, as soon as they get the girl, they take her to Europe and sell her into a brothel oh. and condemn the poor girl. And so the Booths find out about this, William and Catherine, and Catherine Booth says, I could not sit quiet once I knew about this. I felt like I was betraying humanity if I didn't say something. Yeah. So she would go into these bars and these smoky dens and she would confront these men and then they would like chase her out. And, and so they decided they were going to buy one of these girls out of the sex trafficking. And they do, they rescue her. But then the sex traffickers say, well, you're participating in the sex trafficking because you bought one. And so it turns into this big lawsuit and it's front page news in England for like months. Wow. And the booze win. And it so uh, popularized this terrible crime of sex trafficking of young girls that they passed a law aging the ra raising the age of consent in England. Uh, and so the booze the started the Salvation Army. Uh, they also uh, stopped, the, they were making matches where you'd strike a match and it would light. Uh, but the way it would work is they'd take the match and the, somebody would dip, dip it on their tongue to get a little moisture and dip it in phosphorus. And then they would do that to every single match so that the phosphorus would cause the spark that would light the match. Well, they would get fossy jaw. And, the, and at nighttime, the law, the jaw would literally glow green and your teeth would rot out and the bone would rot away. Oh, gosh. And so William and Catherine Booth pushed through outlawing of the, uh, the, the strike list, you know, and they created the matches that you have to strike on a little um, yeah. strike yeah. pad. Yeah. And so whenever you get to a little pack of matches and you strike them on that pad, well, that goes back to William and Catherine Booth. Is that right? And so they start. This, this, is, <laughs> just, this, this is really is amazing history. Encyclopedia. <laughs> Go but ahead. it spreads worldwide. And so now uh, their motto was uh, John um, 1723, uh, spirit, mind, and body. It was all Christian. Yes. You know, I mean, that was the, the YMCA. And then the Salvation Army uh, spread. And um, 
Uh, and then their daughter, Evangeline Booth, takes it over. And she, when there's an earthquake in San Francisco, Salvation Army there, World War I, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have all the support staff within the Army. It was a volunteer organization, Salvation Army, goes over to Europe and helps all the troops and so forth. And uh, so Franklin Roosevelt even gives accommodation to Evangeline Booth, and wow. this woman leader of this international organization mm -hmm. that's doing all this relief. Just a powerful, powerful And story. it's still going on today. It's still going on today. And you just took a whole bunch of stuff and gave it to yes. them just recently. So that's we, right. So we, uh, we always encourage people to, su to support oh, the Salvation, Salvation Army. Salvation Army, Fabulous. absolutely. Uh, uh, how, how did they, uh, it's like they've got uniforms when you see a Salvation Army, it looks like a soldier. Right, it, it, so it's a, a, a semi-military structure for the organization. And you have to, you have to pass right. their requirements? Yeah, and, and, and so as I study organizations, all of them started with uh, like a Christian beginning. Mm -hmm. Harvard, Yale, and everything. And then yeah. you gradually see how they get off track. A yeah. yeah. little bit here, a little bit there. They get some yeah. people on the... Yeah the board that maybe you're wanting to push a yeah. LGBT agenda or something, yeah. and they gradually move away from it. Uh, but the Salvation Army has stuck true to their mission of their yes, founders. They have. They have. And it is really, really encouraging. Amazing. Uh, can we talk about, uh, talk about Dwight L. Moody and what he did, but how he was led to Christ by a shoe salesman? Right, so. It's in the book. <laughs> so 1857, you have a person in New York that has an idea to put a sign out and says, come in this office to pray at lunchtime. He's waiting and waiting, it's noon. So just about over and one person comes in and they pray for like 10 minutes. And so the next day, a couple people come in. The next day, a couple more, a couple more. The next day, a thousand. The next day they have a meeting and there's 10,000 meeting in New York, 20,000, 30, and they're meeting in Chicago and Philadelphia and Los Angeles. This layman's prayer meeting revival. There's no church organizing it. There's no organization organizing it. It's totally laymen, common people, and they're praying for an hour every single day. This prayer meeting revival sweeps the country, 1857. Wow. Well, in Chicago, you have a shoe salesman named Dwight L. Moody, and he gets saved during this uh, layman's prayer meeting revival, and he decides that he wants to do something, so there's a, an abandoned saloon in downtown Chicago, and he gets it to teach these immigrant poor kids the Bible. And he starts a Sunday school class. He said, it's the greatest deception of the devil to think that kids can't understand the gospel because mm -hmm. Jesus uses a child as the example of faith, right? And so this Sunday school class grows to hundreds to, to 1,500. When Abraham Lincoln got elected president, uh, you know, 19, 1860, he travels through Chicago because he's from Illinois yes. on his way to D.C. He stops off at Dwight L. Moody's Sunday school class and sits in it with all the kids. <laughs> and after the class, Dwight L. Moody says, um, well, uh, Mr. Lincoln, do you have anything you want to share with the, the kids? And Lincoln says, well, if you all do what that man tells you, you'll be just fine. <laughs> so, wow. so this Dwight L. Moody gets a guy named Ira Sankey. They roll up a barrel yes. on a street corner. He stands up and sings. A crowd comes around and D.L. Moody gets up and preaches. And he ends up causing, and he uses the YMCA to begin to have revival meetings. And it spreads all across Chicago. And then he begins to travel across America. And then there's P.T. Barnum with the Ringling yes. Barnum and Bailey Circus. And, and he had a great uh, Roman hippodrome uh, there in New York City great big you know auditorium building but then P.T. Barnum decides to take his circus on the road and you so he had this empty building and he let uh, D.L. Moody use it and then you had some of the wealthy businessmen uh, Cyrus McCormick and so forth that are giving money to D.L. Moody to help him and so now he's got this big Roman hippodrome and by influencing New York he's influencing the country sure. and 25,000 people on Sunday for church and with we five, think we got big ones today. Yeah, that's right. With five thousand waiting outside, I mean, there's like uh, like five thousand, you know, in the choir and the ushers. I mean, the staff <laughs> to put all this on. It's just phenomenal. And then he goes to Europe and he's preaching in Europe, and, and you know, with the Queen and all the the crowds there. And then he's coming back. It's in like 1892, and the boat breaks the drive shaft, and it's drifting out of the lane where all the ships go. 
and it starts taking on water and it's tilting and tilting and tilting and they n n nobody can see him and then um what uh deal moody starts praying and uh a, a ship spots him and then they get rescued and he was older now and he's tired and he, he said i was not gonna do anything for the 1892 chicago world's fair but after that i decided i'm just gonna give him my best shot well the 1892 Chicago World's Fair, you have millions of people coming from around yeah, the world yeah, there. Yeah. And D.L. Moody says, yeah, there's a big fireworks display. Who's going to come to hear a preacher after that? He says, a couple come in until the place was packed. <gasps> and every night it was packed. Week after week, month after month it was packed. And that, he ended up influencing the world through that. And, um, and, but in Chicago, they had a big fire, burnt down you know, half the city, and he helped to do rebuilding it, the YMCA's. And so he rebuilt his church, and that church is still going on. Oh, yes. Right? Absolutely. And uh, they started the Moody Bible Institute and yeah. so forth. My dad brought me there when I was a teenager. Well, yeah. and Erwin Lutzer. Yeah. Moody uh, Memorial Church. Yeah, Church. Erwin Lutzer. He's yeah. been, he was there for yeah. years. And I, so when, I, when I walked in there, in fact, our, our niece graduated yeah, from, from Moody. Moody, mm -hmm. Moody Bible Institute. Mm. And my sister attended Moody Bible Institute, yeah. so it was a real influence on us. But my dad would drive 20 miles, actually more than 20 miles, to the Moody Memorial Church, yeah. and I would sit up in the balcony, and and you know I thought that was the biggest church. I mean I thought it was just <laughs> massive. Many many years passed, and I went back there, went to the same place where I used to sit as a teenager. It looked small. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how things change. Yeah. So so, but I mean that, and they still that church is still there. Still there. Nobody still knocked it down. Beautiful church. Still the, the organ gospel. with the with the uh, yeah. with the uh, huge um, what do they call those babies? I don't the know. Flutes for the organ, yeah. and and I mean, it, it is just, it is historic, but but that influence is just. But, well, then that that influenced Billy Sunday. Yes, he was a Chicago White Stockings, White yeah. Sox yes. baseball player. At the height of his career, he um, is walking down the street, hears some singing at Pacific Garden Mission, his songs his mom used to sing. He gets, goes more, he gets saved and wants to marry the, a girl who's volunteering there. And the dad said, no, you're a baseball player. He says, you guys just, you know, once your body's shot, you end up being poor, you know. And, but finally he convinces the dad to let him. And his wife encourages him and he preaches his first. And here, it's, it's national news and yeah. radio preaching was just wow. invented. So now he's preaching all over. Yeah. And, and, and Billy Sunday then became an internationally known oh, he sure revivalist. Did. And then comes Billy Graham, and then, I mean, th this yeah. would be one of your best. Yeah. Sorry, your, your wife on, on this one, that's right here. <laughs> and, but, but it is. It, uh. it, I mean, you, you will not, prom I know, I, I don't even have to assume this, you will not stop reading it. Trust me, one of the best. Thank God you. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.